Hello, and welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and a software developer at Axonic, Sarah Tori. Welcome to the fourth season of Exploring Axon. In this episode, I spoke with my two wonderful colleagues, Sarah Pellegrini and Milan Savage. Sarah and Milan have been working closely together on developing Axon Server and Axon Framework for the past four years. We discussed different types of messages, commands, events, and queries, as well as message routing patterns. We discussed the various protocols used to route these messages by Axon Server, such as gRPC and HTTP. We also discussed some communication challenges, such as latency, benefits and drawbacks of it, back pressure, and flow control. We also touched on cluster configuration and raft protocol. For more information on clustering next and server and the raft protocol, I have linked my episode with Milan where we discuss these topics in depth. I hope you enjoy my talk with Sarah and Milan, and let's have a listen. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Milan. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about some really interesting um, things that I have touched on before and some of them in a little bit uh, more detail, but um, I'm really excited to kind of bring some of those topics together uh, with the both of you and uh, have a really good understanding of some of these uh, uh, protocols, processes that uh, we implement in Axon Server and Axon Framework uh, uh, or in general in our platform. So before I start with all my questions, Sarah, can you introduce yourself and uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where you are, what you do, and uh, yeah, whatever else you'd like to share. Oh, thank you, Sarah. So my name is uh, Sara too, Sara Pellegrini, and I am Italian. I am a software engineer and I've joined Axonic uh, four years ago. And yes, I'm basically uh, a software engineer for uh, Axonic platform. Thank you so much. And uh, Sarah focuses a lot on uh, both the framework and uh, Axon server. So I'm really happy to have you finally do an episode with me. (laughs) We've been trying to get this going for a while, but I'm super, super happy to have you. Uh, And hi again, Milan. You and I had talked about a couple of um, really cool topics in the past, but I haven't had you here for a while. So thank you so much for uh, joining me today and uh, talking to both Sarah's about some really cool, cool topics today. So tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do for Axonic and uh, when you joined and anything else you'd like to share. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for having me again. It's really a pleasure to speak to two Sarahs at the same time. <laughs> of course. <laughs> pleasure is all mine. Yeah. So yeah, basically working uh, for Axonic for almost four years now. Uh, Sarah and I started, I believe, the same week. Uh, and the, oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> And we work uh, closely together on a lot of uh, different stuff. Yeah, so working on Axon Framework, Axon Server, uh, giving trainings, helping out our customers. So that that's uh, my responsibilities. And yet I'm located in Novi Sad, that's a city in Serbia. Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, without further ado, let's, let's get to it. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about Uh, message routing and uh, message routing patterns and also how we can implement um, these messages into our Axon platform. So first, though, let's talk about uh, different messages. So when we're talking about message-driven architecture, what are we talking about? Milan, can you start us with that? Which kind of messages are we looking at? Yes, so people usually start with only events uh, and think that, okay, if I have events, for communication between different components, this is completely sufficient, and I can express all of my intents with only events. However, in practice, that is not always true. Um, so we uh, identified several types of messages. One of them are commands. Uh, so commands are basically expressing an intent to change something with the system, while events basically represent a fact that something has changed within the system. And of course, we don't want to have the same routing of those two types of messages. For commands, we are interested only in one component to handle it. But in events, we are interested in several components. Uh, So basically, several components are able to handle these events and do whatever with them. 
And lastly, we have queries, which are basically used uh, to retrieve a certain information. There is a direct query, which will basically try to uh, target only one handler to respond to us. There is also scatter gather that is going uh, to target several query, uh, qu uh, query handlers, gather the result and uh, uh, serve it back to us. And you also have a subscription query, which is basically pretty similar to a direct query, but uh, with the change that it will send whenever there is an update to that initial information that we got, uh, it will send it back uh, to us. And of course, uh, we don't want to use the same routing patterns for all these three types of messages. Right. And so um, what you mentioned actually, um, just to kind of recap the queries especially, is um, something that um, struck me as very interesting when uh, first learning about different types of queries. Well, think point to point is obviously, as you mentioned, is the easiest route. You just send one um, question to a component on the query side and get a response back, scatter gather, you can send to several different components that think may be able to handle this. And you may get one answer, you may get several answers uh, back. And of course, with the subscription query, you get the real time update um, with, um, actually Axon Framework has a really nice way of doing it with the emitters. So you have the, um, the update emitters that uh, help with that. So going back to um, just how we want to route these messages, uh, starting with commands, for instance, what, uh, how is the routing done? Because as you mentioned, we don't want um, all of these messages to be handled the same way or routed the same way. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about how the uh, message routing works, uh, maybe specifically in Axon framework or just in general, if you'd like to. So <clears throat> for a command, for example, the routing mechanism is uh, quite simple because uh, each uh, command must be executed once and only once. So even if there are multiple applications capable of handling a certain type of, of command, it will be routed only to one instance, as Milan explained before. Um, at the same time, in order to optimize the basically the speed of execution of commands, uh, Axon Server implements a routing mechanism that allows to forward uh, all the commands that are basically identified by the same routing key to the same instance, to the same client. So normally the routing key by default corresponds to the identifier of the aggregate. In practice, all the commands related to the same aggregate will always be managed by the same instance. And this basically allows to have uh, any type of optimization, such as, for example, the use of uh, a cache to prevent, uh, on the client side, multiple uh, frequent trading of uh, the aggregate status through event sourcing. And yeah, this is uh, how we implement, basically, uh, the command routing. Uh, Axon Server uses a consistent hash algorithm to route uh, the mm, command to the correct instance of the application that can handle this command. Oh, that's really, really interesting to, to know. And I think that's what uh, makes Axon Server um, a better uh, way to to really uh, communicate with with the commands on um, let's say the framework side because it knows exactly where it goes and um, using the consistent hashing it actually really helps with the with the whole process so that's that's really great to know um, how about events then Milan how how are we routing events yes yeah, so for events we uh, are using uh, a uh, a pattern that is uh, quite common in the uh, world of software engineering in general. Uh, right. So it is a publish subscriber pattern, right? So we have several parties that are interested in handling a certain event, certain event type, and they're going to register to Axon Server telling, okay, this is uh, these are actually the types because they can be, of course, several for a sing single application, single Axon Server client. It doesn't have to be Axon Framework application, of course. These are the types that I can handle, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Axon Server is going to send uh, e events to, uh, to interesting parties. However, uh, since those events can be upcasted, upcasted on the uh, receiving side, uh, Axon Server, uh, as a matter of fact, cannot know 
which actual events to send, right? So right. It, it is going to send all of the events. However, mm -hmm. once the client receiving party uh, gets uh, an, an, a batch of events, it will say, okay, but I'm really, after upcasting, I'm really, really not interested in these ones. So please yeah. do not send them again. So it will send, uh, how to say, uh, information back on mm -hmm. which events we are not interested in. So Action Server knows to optimize in the future and not to send those events anymore. That's really cool. So it kind of like a learning platform or learning way for Axon Server to know yeah. what not to do next time to really optimize the process. That's really, really interesting. Correct. Correct. So then going on to queries, of course, we touched on commands and events, and now we have to get back to queries. Um, talk, to, talk to me a little bit about that, Sarah. Um, how is it done for the query side? Yeah, the query as uh, uh, you mentioned before is a, a little bit more complex uh, scenario because we have uh, several kind of queries. The first possibility is uh, what we call point-to-point -point query or generic query, basically in which there is a consumer and although there, there are many potential producers, uh, only one of them will uh, return the answer because they should return, all this. All of them should return the same answer. And um, so in this case, Axon Server um, wrote the, the request, the message, to a single instance that is the faster one. So we measure statistically uh, the time of response and we uh, decide to route mainly to the faster instance. Right. And the second possibility is... Uh, um, the scatter getter query. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, the answer, uh, so several instances, several components can offer different answers to the same request. Mm -hmm. So basically it is necessary to route the request to all clients that are able to provide an answer. And of course, we need to have a deadline to, to stop waiting for answers and to basically complete the response for, uh, for the consumer, for the client that requested the query. And the last possible option is the subscription query. Um, this is the case where the client wants to listen for all possible updates related to a particular request. Also in this uh, scenario, the initial request is uh, propagated to um, basically all the instances that are able to handle it, uh, but only one of them will provide the initial result. And all of them are able to return the relevant updates uh, for the request over time. Yeah, and that makes sense. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the um, notion of the timeout for the scatter gather query, for instance, because it's really important to um, because the reason for that is sometimes, for example, um, and we have this in, in uh, some of our trainings when we talk about um, a request for a price of an item. And if you have a um, special occasion uh, within your store that uh, changes the the price for a certain item, then you want to have that uh, available to you by using scattergather query. And that gives you the option to receive all of the prices, for example, the, the actual price, that's the normal usual price, and then you get a different price for the price of a uh, valued customer. And then uh, if you have a special sales going on, then you have that uh, additional response coming back to you. However, you do have to have that timeout to basically specify when that response is coming and when you will not receive that response anymore. So for, for instance, if the sale is over, you will not receive the, the uh, price for that uh, particular request anymore, which is really, really interesting. And then uh, same thing for the uh, subscription query, which uh, helps to have the updates coming in regularly when it's needed. And uh, it kind of uh, decides what um, updates go through. And uh, if you need to change your requirements in the future, that makes it simple too. So fantastic. So thank you. So we went through the uh, routing uh, ways of how uh, how to get the messages from one uh, point to another. Let's talk about now how can we implement these routing patterns? How do we decide, uh, or how did we decide? Because we have already made these decisions. How did we decide to implement these routing mechanisms 
um, within the Axon platform. Um, so yeah, starting by w whichever, if you want to do commands, events, or queries, or just generally um, speaking about them, fine too. So Milan, would you like to start that or? Yeah, of course. Uh, as you said, it all sounds uh, beautiful in, in theory, but now let's see in practice. But exactly. Actually, what it actually happens when you want to hit the wire, when you actually want to send a message. So right. let me first of all start with the protocols that uh, we are using, that we are exposing uh, via Axon Server. So uh, we expose gRPC API of Axon Server. Okay. And we also expose HTTP, right? Uh, HTTP is there not for everything, so we cannot do everything with HTTP. There are obvious uh, differences uh, between those two protocols. I will go into details of those in, in a couple. Uh, but gRPC is basically if you want to have a client that will connect to Axon server, send messages, you're going to use uh, gRPC, right? Okay. Uh, HTTP is also... Uh, so HTTP 1, right? It's also used uh, for uh, UI uh, of the Axon server, so for the dashboard. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the important benefits why we opted for uh, gRPC, right, uh, is because it is uh, built on top of HTTP 2. Okay. Uh, one really, really important benefit that we use a lot here is that we can have multiplexer. So what does this mean? This means that we can have several uh, streams over the same TCP connection, right? And it will uh, give us a lot of benefits uh, when we want to send uh, a lot of messages, right? right. Uh, even further, those messages now do not have to be serialized to text, so to, to be um, large uh, unnecessarily. Uh, mm -hmm. They can be uh, sent over a binary format. So this is also what we opted for in Axon Server. Apart from, sorry, not apart from, but alongside the gRPC, uh, we are also uh, using a protobuf to serialize our messages. Right? And okay. These are two really important protocols uh, supported by Axon uh, Server. However, if you want to write a client to actually send messages, you're going to use uh, gRPC. Okay, and I know I'm doing it a little bit backwards, but just to um, give a quick explanation of what gRPC is, uh, just kind of in like a couple of sentences, if you don't mind, uh, just yeah, in case sure, sure. somebody's listening to it and they're not familiar. Of course, of course. So it is uh, a Google protocol for RPC, uh, remote procedure uh, calls. Uh, basically, uh, it gives you uh, a set of services that you can expose Right, you define mm -hmm. your operations that your service can handle, types of inputs and outputs, right? And right. it's also really important because it is built on top of the HTTP two that you mm -hmm. can have input or output type to be a stream. This is a really, really powerful, uh, right. powerful thing which we use a awesome. lot. Uh, awesome. Yeah. In, in Excel server. Yeah. In Excel server. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Sarah, yes. Yeah, um, I just want to add that. Uh, when we uh, work in a distributed environment, we cannot ignore the problem of network communication that obviously introduce a delay in, of course, the propagation of uh, messages, of uh, commands, events, and queries that we talk about. And uh, we typically um, call this communication delay with the name of latency, right? The latency can uh, mm, depend on many factors. And... Uh, some of them are uh, within our control, some of others are not. So um, it often uh, we have to basically find a compromise that fits your use case and um, to decide, of course, how we deploy our application in order to, to reduce the latency. But if we can't intervene on latency, we can uh, certainly use this, uh, uh, the communication protocol to our advantage. Uh, in fact, using, as uh, Mila mentioned, a single TCP connection for the transmission of multiple stream of information, we can optimize the message execution throughput, basically parallelizing the, works, the work thanks to the uh, asynchronous nature of these architectures. Basically, in practice, um, this will not improve the time required for the execution of a single command, for example, 
but it will possible to exceptionally improve the number of commands that can be executed in one minute, for example. So this, uh, the use of this stream is very uh, powerful tool. And uh, of course, it has a certain complexity as uh, at implementation level. Of course. And I'm so glad that you brought up the, the um, notion of latency and how we can uh, manage that within Axon as well, which is really uh, great to know. So alongside that, or maybe in addition to that, then how do we do deal with uh, back pressure? How, how do we handle that? All right. So... Uh, when it comes to back pressure, let me first explain what back pressure is. <laughs> I don't yes, want to make please, thank you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can read my mind. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to make the same mistake as I did for GRPC. No, no, no mistake. I, I should have asked in, in, in advance. But yes, no, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, so tell us what back pressure is and why is it important? So basically, if you want, especially nowadays, when you want to build a software system, right, it is really important that it is reactive, right? So that it is elastic, message-driven, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so when we say that something is message-driven, that it means that it communicates via messages, of course. However, if you have a producer of those messages uh, sending a lot of messages that our consumer cannot keep up with, uh, our consumer will overflow, right? And it will just fail, which is not so nice behavior. Right. And that's where... yeah, and that's Not where, wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely unwanted. Yeah. Uh, and that's where back pressure kicks in, right? So back pressure yeah. is basically a mechanism for a consumer to tell the producer, okay, it is enough, I cannot keep up, uh, just stop sending me. Or even to be more proactive and say, okay, give me uh, 10 messages. Okay, I'm going to process them. Once I'm done, I'm going to ask for more. This is not that, uh, how to say, performant. Usually what we do, we say, okay, give me 10 messages. Once I'm done with seven of them, I'm going to ask for uh, 10 more, right? Because I don't want to have uh, uh, me waiting in an idle state once I processed all messages to receive a new batch. So usually at 25%, depending on the use case, we ask for more messages. So this is in general what a back pressure means. And... Uh, especially in our Exxon platform system, we have uh, several Exxon server clients. We have Exxon server in the middle. Especially in a cluster environment, we might have several Exxon servers. Not might, but probably we do. Right. Uh, and this is where back pressure is really, really important. So if I'm an Exxon framework application, I want to talk uh, uh, to some other Exxon framework application or any other application connected to Exxon server. Uh, I want that, uh, how to say, everybody respect me in the community. <laughs> so yeah. if, I cannot, if I cannot keep up with, with the pace of, of uh, uh, processing messages, I want to tell everybody, okay, just slow down uh, with sending. Okay. Let me keep up. Yeah, that's really, that's really cool. Sarah. And if I can add something for, uh, for um, having the back pressure correctly implemented, so for having an effective flow control, it is very important that the basically the entire pipeline is responsive. In practice, uh, the from from the all the steps right of the chain should be responsive, and um, the basic mechanism consists in retrieving the information at the very beginning on, on the on the of the supply chain only when it is necessary. So basically, only when the final consumer requests to receive the new messages. Mm -hmm. And of course, within the supply chain, there are various optimization mechanisms that we can do. Yeah. Uh, and we can, we could uh, represent uh, these in a simplified ways as buffers, basically, that are capable of uh, accumulating a small reserve of data in advance in order to be able to send them uh, extremely quickly if required. And yes, the correct sizing of this buffer, the correct configuration of is, is complex and is a result from a balanced uh, usage of resources. I see. And can gRPC um, help with this, uh, with this whole process as well that we're, we're using in our protocol? Yeah, so gRPC uh, is trying to help us here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, however, um, I mean, this is like a wire, right? So we, we have a wire and it doesn't know what, what the message means. So the message right. can be four megabytes. It can be mm -hmm. several kilobytes. It's really depending on the message. So uh, 
on the gRPC level, we have certain buffers, right? The, the, those are also HTTP2 buffers. Right. Uh, so basically, uh, what are we doing here is we are a little bit lying. So when I say give me two messages, that doesn't just a little mean... bit. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and let me justify this lying. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> it's a white lie, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So when I say give me two messages, that, that doesn't mean that actually a request of two is going to be sent to the producer and, and telling it, okay, send two messages. But okay. how it works, we have uh, a buffer on the receiving side, we have a buffer on the sending side. Uh, when those buffers are filled, we, we then basically say, okay, stop, stop sending. Mm -hmm. And when we want to consume and we say, give me two, it actually does not go to the producer, but it goes to this buffer. Okay. When this buffer is reasonably empty, then we ask for more messages, right? So this is how essentially over gRPC we can achieve uh, back pressure. If you're in single JVM, I'm not using RxJava or Project Reactor, this is how to say a real back pressure without lying, right? If I say, give me two, the producer will give me two. I see. Okay. And is it um, through gRPC or through maybe some other formats, uh, can it be... Um, customized in in terms of how you want this back pressure to to be handled, or you cannot customize it. It's just done on its own. Like so basically, magic. you can uh, you can customize the size of buffers. Right? Yeah. Uh, although uh, gRPC for Java is not that flexible, uh, right. but in theory, yes, you can uh, you can customize those buffers, basically indicating uh, what are your capabilities of message handling. Gotcha. And Sarah, um, what do you think about the, the whole process of maybe optimizing it or customizing it? Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, it gRPC is uh, not very flexible in this term. So, right. yeah, there are some constraints. And um, we managed basically to implement uh, um, a proper uh, Translation between the gRPC protocol and the reactive stream with the reactive project, so we can handle easily this kind of uh, uh, this kind of communication through this implementation. But yes, it is it, it is not so user friendly sometimes. Right. Uh, this uh, yeah, this gRPC protocol in term of back pressure mainly. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, shifting a little bit from that um, or possibly kind of alongside this uh, this conversation. Within Axon itself, um, we have certain ways of configuring clusters and uh, handling some of these uh, topics that we talked about, such as routing the messages that we kind of touched on earlier and also um, possibly handling the latency, back pressure, all of these things. How are we then dealing with it on um, our side, on the Axon server side, for instance, um, all of these different ways of um, handling these um, items and uh, in regards to configuring these uh, clusters and nodes that we're using. Yes. So basically, um, Axon server can be configured uh, in, a, in cluster, of course. Uh, the Enterprise Edition um, can be uh, basically provide the, um, the cluster option and you can configure a cluster made of several nodes. And mm -hmm. um, this can uh, really help, uh, for example, uh, when we talk uh, about uh, uh, this communication protocol and the usage of uh, multiple stream to, of course, improve the throughput of uh, command and uh, query execution, um, basically increasing the number of nodes we can uh, improve uh, uh, basically the performances of the cluster and improve uh, basically the scalability of the system horizontally. Um, and uh, in, in some way, basically, in, we overcome the problem of latency. Uh, if this is generally true for the routing and execution of uh, common and queries, uh, when uh, we, and also, of course, for reading events, when it comes to writing events, the story is a little bit different. Because um, if you want to replicate persistent information in a um, distributed environment in a secure way, 
you must rely on a consensual al algorithm. And um, Axon Server is no exception uh, in this term and uh, decided to implement uh, um, raft uh, algorithm in order to achieve consensus. And um, basically, that means that each write must be confirmed by the majority of the primary nodes inside a replication group. And that means that basically uh, the latency pl plays an important role in this. Uh, it is not possible to scale horizontally uh, because we always need the majority of nodes basically to acknowledge the transaction. And this must be taken into consideration when you need to identify the correct configuration of your cluster. In fact, it is possible, for example, to decide to install three primary nodes within a single region to reduce the communication latency between them, and maybe to install a backup node in a completely different region that is necessary in case of disaster recovery. If, on the other hand, the write latency is uh, acceptable for you, even installing the three primary nodes in three different regions, that's perfect because the cluster, in this case, will also be able to support the failure of one of these three regions completely without downtime. That is really amazing and really helpful, especially when, as you mentioned, in a uh, case of disaster recovery, that's really um, amazing to have. So another question is uh, maybe for you, Milan, um, folks who are using um, a pending of the events, um, latency is not that great in, in that um, in that situation, having latency, for instance. So how, or, or as Sarah mentioned, the horizontal scalability. So why consistency is needed and how can we kind of help if somebody doesn't want to, or if somebody wants to uh, use the horizontal scalability or append the events, um, how is it possible for them, basically? All right. So basically here, uh, we can re uh, remove latency if we say we are going to have only one node. <laughs> so we latency. can totally remove it so that yes. <laughs> we don't have to worry about so it. So we <laughs> get rid we get rid of this. <laughs> we don't need it. However, of course, <laughs> we, it is not reasonable to do that because if right. if that instance is down, then you're, you're not going to have a good time in, in production. Right. Right? <laughs> yes. So we need to have more, more nodes, right? We need to replicate our data to, to more instances. So if mm -hmm. some of instances are down, uh, we can still serve our clients with, with uh, their events. Mm -hmm. So this is why we uh, need consistency uh, to basically uh, say, regardless to which node we direct the write, the write will be written uh, to uh, in best uh, situation, best scenario to all modes, but we right. do not need to wait for all of them. We need to wait only for majority in mm -hmm. order to acknowledge this right. And once we have this uh, uh, confirmed, this right, uh, that basically means to whichever node we we go uh, to read that this information is going to be available, right? Right. So this is why uh, consistency is really needed. If we as a system, as access server, tell you that this is written, it is actually written, right? right. Regardless of which node goes down, which node likes to be a leader, etc., cetera, et cetera. Right, that makes sense. And um, my last question of the, this uh, this part um, for Sarah, maybe, um, why is latency not so good when it comes to also persisting uh, the events? Yeah, it's exactly um, for that reason, because it's something that uh, uh, you uh, can avoid as you need it basically to uh, wait for the acknowledgement of the majority. So the, um, the communication um, basically required several steps uh, before the transaction is uh, completely acknowledged and committed. First of all, the client send events to be stored to Axon Server Node. Axon Server Node basically replicate across the cluster this information waiting for, for the acknowledgement of the majority. And only at this moment, 
basically we can uh, commit and we can confirm the transaction to be uh, in the event store to the client. So it's uh, these two rounds of communication of latency are important and must be considered, of course, if this is a, a, a critical point for your use case. It really depends from use cases and uh, from, of course, platform and from the network um, that you are using. So sometimes uh, it's uh, for many customer of us, it's not a problem to have three nodes in three different zones. Some other times they basically prefer to have a cluster installed in the same region in order to decrease this latency and uh, having other mechanism to basically manage uh, the possibility of unavailability of the full region. Of course. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So lots that we covered in a, in a pretty short time. And uh, I would like to, at some point uh, in the future, go a little bit more in a detailed discussion about uh, some of these topics, of course, with uh, both of you, either one of you. So I'll come back to you with more questions later. And um, Milan and I actually uh, recorded a really uh, great episode on uh, Raft Protocol. So um, I will link that in the um, in the notes of this uh, episode. That way, uh, folks who are interested can um, learn or listen to that uh, a little bit more into uh, depth. So thank you so much both for joining me. I really hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. And I look forward to speaking with you more in the future. Thank you, Sarah, for having us. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thanks so much. Have a great day. I hope you liked my talk with Sarah and Milan. Please join me next time as I discover other amazing topics with wonderful and talented guests. Until then, have a great time and happy coding.